Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're here with us to stay curious with Mr. Jay Honeycutt. Very special guest, Mr. Honeycutt. Glad to have you here. Uh, Jay, how are you? You support our museum. Yeah. You've been on Stay Curious before. We got a program here that people are going to be fascinated yeah, about. Doing good. Tell us what you're going to talk about today. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about Apollo training for both the flight crew and the flight the flight control team, and uh, go through how we got how we got through uh, all the flights in uh, during the Apollo program. Well, we are going to learn some fascinating things from Mr. Honeycutt. Of course, many of you know him as the former director of Kennedy Space Center for two years, 95, 96, and 97. Before that, he held, he was one of the architects of the space shuttle era, uh, carved a lot of fat off of it, for sure, when he was the manager of the shuttle program after the Challenger accident. And uh, just a all-around good guy and a very humble man. And uh, you're going to hear some things that are just really fascinating. When you were 27 years old, young man, and you, who was your idol at the time working at Houston? Well, working in Houston, everybody was in um, flight operations. Chris Kraft was our, uh, he was our leader and he was our hero. The great Chris Kraft. Now, folks that are under 40, we're turning back to, to the time here to the 60s when all of this that Mr. Honeycutt's going to talk about is new ground. Nobody knew, knew anything about people putting in pe people in space as well as managing it from uh, the obvious things of the health of the astronauts to the pieces and parts that all have to come together. And Mr. Honeycutt was one of these simulation operators that were known to be creative, imaginative, devious and sometimes even sneaky yeah, chick yeah chicken some <laughs> or whatever so you'd be throwing the monkey wrench into the works of people going to the moon and back and he's got some great stories about it we keep wanting to set back the time of 50 years ago our our, our phone computers could manage the whole program where you had at one time 14 computers that filled two rooms doing your sims correct sir that's right yeah, yeah. well let's uh, show you a couple pretty pictures and turn it over there's mr honeycutt as he supported us during our shuttle fest one he put together a great story about the 50-year legacy and the nixon administration okaying the 5.5 billion dollar budget we have ed on stay curious there you are on stay curious a couple years ago and uh I picked this picture out for you there, one of those formal pictures I know you love. But there's your name in Japanese, Mr. Honeycutt, in case you hadn't seen it written out there. They had it bottled up there. So, yeah. well, all right, we're going to send you over here to him. And this is Johnson Space Center in 1965 yeah. being under construction. Selvin, you might want to move that picture over. We got Selvin on the board today as Marty took the day off. There you go. All right, so Jay uh, started off for us about uh, uh, doing something that had never been done before. Yeah, well, I think it would be helpful to remind people of what uh, what Apollo was from a, from an operational point of view, from the human spaceflight point of view. Uh, we came out of uh, Mercury and Gemini with a with a two successful programs that had that had a series of successful flights which sort of demonstrated the uh, various procedures and techniques that were going to be necessary in order to uh, execute the lunar landing. And those flights began with, uh, there were three un unmanned flights over the Saturn, uh, the Saturn launch vehicle just verifying that he, uh, that it, that it worked. And then we got into the first flight with a crew that was Apollo seven with the crew of uh, Walt Cunningham, of, uh, Walt Cunningham uh, Wally Shira and uh, Don Isley. And they, they flew a Earth orbit demonstration of the command and service module, uh, which was the, the, uh, the part of the vehicle that had the pointy end on it that where, uh, which housed the, the uh, crew module. Uh, after set Apollo 7, uh, we were scheduled to fly a demonstration flight with the command module in, uh, in the lunar module in Earth orbit, and the lunar module wasn't quite ready yet, so the powers that be decided we'd uh, 
just take the command mo service module and go straight to the moon, which we did in uh, December of 68. And, uh, and had a successful flight demonstrated we could, we could go a long distance away and get back home. Within, then the, the limb was ready. So we flew Apollo 9, which was, a, which was a demonstration flight of the command module and the lunar module crewed uh, in, in Earth orbit to demonstrate that we could separate, fly around, and come back, rendezvous, and, and dock. Once that was completed, they flew Apollo 10, which was a uh, practice mission to go to the moon. It, it did it to land on the moon. It did everything that we had to do except uh, the last 10 miles from the from lower lo lunar orbit down to the down to the surface. A lot of people say, well, why didn't the crew just go ahead and go? And uh, that wasn't in the plan, and the crew followed the plan. Uh, then we had to follow 11, which which uh, was a, the lunar landing, followed by 12, which was an equally successful landing, fo followed by 13, which which uh, everybody should watch the movie because it's pretty well representative of what happened during that flight. And then we had 14, 15, 16, and 17, which were all successful landing uh, missions that uh, that terminated the uh, program. So why did we train for this? Well, the first reason, obviously, was to we had a plan, but we didn't know whether procedurally and whether it, time-wise, it could be made to work. So our first idea was to verify that plan. Next was to build a team to execute it. We had um, the flight crew at that time were all uh, what we call uh, single-seat fighter pilots. So they were, they were all uh, sufficiently confident in their own uh, abilities to, uh, find, to figure out if there was a problem and to react to it and do whatever had to be done to, uh, to be successful. We also had a flight control team that was, was uh, staffed with, again, a number of uh, fighter pilots who had equal, and, and interestingly enough, fresh college fresh outs who uh, had an equally uh, strong set of beliefs in their ability to get things done. So our job in, in the simulation world was to put those two entities together and and develop a team that worked together where one one trusted the other and uh, and uh, w w was willing to to uh, to be dependent on the other to be uh, successful. Uh, in a, in addition, uh, all all these flights were were fairly complex and had a series of complex procedures in place to make them happen. And uh, it was our job to to uh, Flesh out those procedures that that had a uh, that had a uh, less than 100% confidence in getting uh, done. Make sure that the crew could do and the flight control team could do what they had uh, had to do to make the flight successful. Uh, they also operated under a series of mission rules, which which says if this happens, this is what we'll do. Our job was again to put them in a flight environment and see if they really meant what they said, if you're really going to do it or you're going to do something differently. Uh, we also, the, the flight, con particularly the flight control team on the ground was a pretty complex uh, uh, hierarchy of, of, uh, of people and things that were necessary in order to get, to get an agreement to do anything. We'll, we'll go through in a minute here what, how that really work but our but our job was to make sure that the team on the ground could communicate with each other up and down the uh, up and down the chain and um, come up with the right kinds of decisions that, that were uh, necessary to be successful in flight and to develop a confidence in themselves and each other that they could uh, that they could exercise uh, the plan and that so that's what we uh, we did the training was was uh, basically of three types. We had we had crew only training, we had flight controller only training, and we had integrated training, which put the two those two entities together and had them operate in a mission uh, environment. 
the crew training started obviously with classroom training here's what the systems are here's what the mission is here's uh the things you you need to know about how these things work then the crew had a series of part test trainers where they where they uh, practiced on doing things like rendezvous things like docking uh things like the the uh the, uh, there were several abort modes during during ascent from uh, from uh, from Earth orbit that required the crew to get off the Saturn vehicle before they achieved orbit, and they had some part test trainers that allowed them to uh, train that. They had a vehicle called the Lunar Landing Test Vehicle, A.K.A. the Flying Bedstead, mm -hmm. that uh, that the the, uh, the 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 crews that were going to going to actually pilot the vehicle for landing had to learn to fly that they had a they had a uh, a rover which was a little golf cart looking thing that the crew used to run around the moon in the, in the later in the later missions and uh and then they had geology training where they had to go out and uh and poke around in the rocks ar ar around the country and, and around the uh, particular parts of the world which that had terrain that was somewhat similar to what uh, to what they could expect on on the lunar surface and they had several other uh, part test things uh, they also had a set of simulators they had one set of the command module simulator and the lunar module simulator in Houston and another set down here in uh, in Florida the one in Houston was primarily done for uh, for system development and for uh, for initial f familiarization of the crew with the uh, with the mission, the one down here in Florida were used to primarily for uh, mission specific training. Uh, in addition, they had a simulated lunar surface that uh, was used by the flight control team and the and the crew to uh, simulate lunar walking around the moon and picking up rocks and doing those things. Well, we're talking with Mr. Jay Honeycutt here, former director of Kennedy Space Center, but we're talking about his early career when he was a Sims manager at Johnson Space Center, which was called not Johnson Space Center then. It was the Man, Man, Space, Flight Center. Man Space Flight Center uh, there in Houston. We're going to see some pictures of where they restored that. Uh, as Jay's talking about this, the simulation people is a group of about 40 people, right, Jay? Yeah, it was about 40 people in our group. And and they had to have the knowledge of how many of those flight controllers and, and, and button pushers are? Well, when you, when you get all the all the people put together, there was probably two or 300. Wow. So these simulators, uh, people like yourself, uh, of course, had to be pretty high in, highly intelligent, but they had to... Uh, be intuitive, and uh, they had to think on their feet, uh, and they also had to listen to a dozen conversations in, in, in their heads. Uh, tell us about that. How how did you sort yeah. it out? Well, we we uh, we monitored we, the the, uh, the control center team. We monitored we monitored the the various console positions to to listen to what they were uh, what they were. Uh, doing any problem they might be chasing or anything they might be worried about in addition we had to listen to their <clears throat> air to ground traffic and we had to listen to the to the flight director loop and the flight director was trying to manage all these various problems that were, were going on and we're going to get into those four famous flight directors that jay honeycutt was throwing <laughs> monkey wrenches at and their team to solidify them uh, he'll talk about that. Uh, let's look at a couple pictures here where we're we're located here. Jay, uh, there's the uh, uh, there's the big room that's restored. Uh, so where was your? The so uh, our room was over in the top right hand corner, just to the right of the plot boards. Okay, right where there. the glass windows are. Yeah, where those glass windows are. That was called the C. SCA was simulation control area. Simulation control yeah. area. There's a good acronym for you. Yeah. Simulation control SCA, A for yeah. area. Yeah. Okay, I like that. Yeah. This is the recreation that Johnson Space Center did a few years ago. Um, uh, and uh, that was home to you. And here's the uh, simulators you're talking about, Jay. What's the one on the left? 
Uh, uh, the, the one, well, it's simula that, that's a lunar module and this command module simulator. I don't know which one is. I don't know which one is which. It's hard to tell what they are because each one of them had this big box <coughs> that was a place over the uh, over the windows of the of the command module and the lunar module that uh -huh. that provide the, the external vision of uh, for the for the crew. It showed it showed star fields and and it showed lunar surfaces and it showed all the things uh, that the crew would see when they looked out the window. Right. I've heard this put in 1965 was the the biggest video game in the world for many years, and those are all yeah. video. Uh, the lunar module's got the surface landing on it and, mm. and so forth. Uh, the What uh, I think is amazing about the simulation people like yourself, Jay, it's easy to envision the c command module and service module and a lunar module, things that you would want to train and have break down there. But what I didn't, didn't realize was the trajectory uh, all over the world and the tracking stations. So you could have a similar tracking station goes down, right? And throw it at that. So you had four basic areas there that from launch to landing that all of your people had to have knowledge yeah. about. Yeah. So the flight controllers, they, they, they had their own training. They had classroom training, which in some cases was the same as what the crew got on how the individual systems worked. We also built uh, within the sim world we built a thing we call the crew system trainer, which was a, basically a mock-up of the of the crew module with all the switches and all the displays that the crew uh, that the crew would have at their disposal during the flight, and we would run the flight controllers through there so that they had an appreciation for when you ask the crew member to throw such and such a switch, <clears throat> they would know where it was and, and how easy it was for the crewman to reach if he might be suited or if he might be strapped in his seat or something like that. So that so they the, there wasn't anything behind these switches uh, other than maybe something that would light up a light or to sh show you that, that it was, was on, but it was primarily a, a, a familiarization of the for the people on the ground on what the crew was going through. Mm -hmm. We also built math models in our uh, in our computer of both the command module and the lunar module so that we could, uh, before we ever met the flight crew, we could s simulate a mission with the, uh, with the, with the sim team. And, and uh, so we could provide the limb, we could provide the CSM. We actually had a, console position called Astro Sim who uh <coughs> who, who who would play the role of the of the uh flight crew and respond to, to a commands and actions that were given to him by the by the ground. Once you got through that then we began integrated sims with the the crew in the simul and they would be in the simulators down at KSC. And it would be it would be full mission uh, would be full mission simulations, and we'll get into what what some of those were here in a in a minute. As far as the control center was concerned, excuse me. <coughs> I don't know if you had that picture of the of the mission control center or not, but anyway, the mission control center was here's the computer was, was, uh, was three uh, three floors. First floor was a real-time computing con uh, <clears throat> complex. Had five IBM 360-75s. State, of, excuse me, the state-of-the-art computer at that. Uh, this is an amazing uh, wound memory yeah, cores. Uh, memory cores. Uh, I think I read where 600 pounds had about 128 megabytes of mm -hmm. memory in it. Yeah. But the five were the five. One of them was a mission computer. One of them was a dynamic standby computer, which ran bit for bit with the, with the mission computer during the, during the mission. One was a development computer. One was a standby in case something broke and 
and then one one three sixty was dedicated to the to the sim world. And we'll get it here in a minute. What was what was in that? The the top two floors, floors two and three, were uh, e each a uh, <clears throat> mission operations control room, and they were they were absolutely uh, identical. Hmm. So floor one and on uh, floor two and floor three. Mocha one and Mocha two. So the ground computer, ground support simulation computer, it was called it was a 360. Oh, excuse me. I went through the. And I'll stop this in a minute. The uh, we had all the ephemeris, all of of uh, the the. Uh, the information necessary to determine where the crew where the crew module was at any as a point in space at any any time during the flight from uh, from liftoff to lunar landing to back to to uh, to mission. And in addition, as you mentioned, we simulated the ground network. This was uh, different as than than today, where you have t the tracking re data relay satellites that provide the crew with. Uh, and the ground with commun continuous communications. Back in those days, you had a series of ground stations strung around the world. Nine, I believe, that uh, that were used to communicate between the ground and the uh, and the crew. So you would you would identify a problem, and then you'd lose the signal, and the and the and the crew would come up. at next time you got acquisition of signal they say well we had this problem and in the ground would figure out what to do and before they could get it passed up they'd lose signal again that you'd have to wait till the next ground station to to, to, to give them up first trading what particularly with things that need attention quick yeah uh, but we had all these remote sites simulated we we simulated their command capability their telemetry track and voice data we also simulated the launch vehicles the uh, simulators ran off of tapes for the launch vehicle, uh, but we we have a model of it so we could actually put failures in it as well and cause uh, cause the crew to have to abort the mission. Uh, and then we had our math models of the lunar module and the and the command and service module along with all the interfaces necessary between them and the. Uh, and the uh, control center and the simulator. Talk a little bit about the, uh, yeah, catch your breath there, get your good drink there. And uh, you talk about uh, the, uh, uh, when would you do a simulation before the mission? Uh, would, would it be, uh, how many months out would it be? Uh, when you would do what Jay was talking about, you do the individual crews together. They simulate the CM and the, and the, the lunar module. People in flight yeah. in Houston yeah. are doing the, the mission without the flight crew, the astronauts, and then you put it together for one long... Yeah, yeah let me get to that in just a minute. Oh, okay. I, 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 I'm, uh, I'm ahead of you there. All right. uh, so the, so the, 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 the ground operations management philosophy... <clears throat> was really straightforward. The the, uh, the boss was craft, and he he sat on the console. That he showed the consoles in the mm -hmm. in the uh, in the mission operations control room <clears throat> a minute ago. And craft was up on the back row, there, sort of right above my head. And the next row down would be the, was the flight director, and. Uh, the next row down from him were all the systems engineers and and uh, support of uh, the support functions electrical mechanical propulsion control systems the medical <clears throat> doctor was in there the uh <clears throat> the capcom who was a who was a capsule communicator who was always an astronaut and the only one that talked directly to the to the crew during uh during flight uh, there was also a network controller that managed all those <coughs> nine remote sites and their interface with the control center and ensured that it uh, 
that it was, uh, you know, they, they were providing the functions that they were supposed to. And then down the front row was the guidance, the trajectory guys, the guidance officer and the, and the flight dynamics officer and the re reentry officer. And then the guy on the end down there was the booster guy. So this was the, this was in the mission ops control room, which was the pr also known as the front room. Each one of these guys had a, uh, had a support room back in the, in the uh, periphery of the control center. So each one of those, those functions, electrical, mechanical propulsion, uh, had a, had a room, uh, right across the hall from where, from where they were sitting with 30 or 40 people in it that were supporting directly the console position. Uh, in addition to that, there was a call a spacecraft analysis function, which said if you were not, if you want to get any information into or from the front room, you had to go through them and ask for it, and then they would, they would get it and provide it to you. Uh, and these guys controlled the uh, headquarters, if headquarters had anything to do. There was a mission evaluation room in another building that was the engineering support provided by JSC. Uh, they also interfaced with the prime contractors, with their vendors and with their suppliers. So there was a chain that went up and down from the flight director all the way down to a supplier where if a problem occurred, they could flesh it out and, and try to determine the seriousness of it and the actions that had to be uh, that had to be taken. The SIM team was sort of a mirror of that, but but as Mark, as Mark said, instead of forty guys, we had one for each one of those uh, those positions, and uh, and uh, we had the simulation supervisor who sort of figured out what <clears throat> what we were doing and modulated the. Uh, Activities is necessary to keep uh, <laughs> to keep uh, a steady flow of action going on in the room. You had to be careful that you didn't. If you gave every console position in the front room a problem to work, you you inundated the flight director with uh, with issues, and it, he 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 got negative training because he couldn't.